Bible class. Glad you're here. Did I say that right, Bible class? Does that, do I sound funny when I say that? My kids make fun of me on my bus all the time. Bible class. Do I really say it like that? I think I just say Bible class. I think it sounds normal. We're glad you're here. Got a couple of announcements, quick announcements I want to make. Um, first of all, on the communion tray, on the table when you come in, there is a thank you. This is not the invitation to our Friends and Family Day. This is the thank you for coming to our Friends and Family Day. So if you uh, invited somebody and they came, either hand this to them or you can put your address, their address and your return address and a postcard stamp on it and mail it to them, however you want to do it. But thank them for coming. What we're going to do on Sunday, I'm going to try to get everybody that was here by way of visitor. So if you had a visitor come, I need their address. We're going to try to sign a card congregationally for each person or each family that was here, and we will send them a thank you card as well. But this is a, uh, another thing that we can send with it, okay? So let's um, get these, send them out, and then we'll also include thank you cards, and we'll have those on Sunday. But I'll need the addresses of the people. So if you brought somebody or somebody came that, that you know, make sure you get me their address and name um, because Sunday was a really, really busy day, and I don't think we got all that information, which is okay. But we just need to, um, to sign those. Sammy just gave me a good idea on that, so I appreciate that. Second thing is our Vacation Bible School invitations that are out on the table. You can take these. Um, the information is for you to fill out right here. If you have any questions on this, if you just look on the front door, there is a sign, a poster of all the information that, you know, the date, the place, the time, the address, all that stuff. So you can fill this out, put a postcard stamp on it, and send it to people, or you can just hand it to your neighbors. So let's make sure that we get these out, okay, to any neighbors that you know, any people that you know. Um, uh, it starts on a Sunday night. And it goes through Thursday. Thursday will be our picnic. Okay, we changed that up a little bit this year. Um, the education committee uh, wanted to, to change that a bit. So we're going to start on Sunday night, hopefully make it a little easier on our teachers. So grab these if you know of somebody to come. We have lots of people to invite, I'm sure. So let's not forget this. Don't forget these. All right. Those are those two announcements. Everybody needs a new outline for tonight. So do you have a new outline which was laying on the communion table when you came in? Everybody have a new outline. Does anybody, I always word that wrong. Who needs a new outline? All right, Stephen, my friend, will hand you a new outline. He's got them coming here. So if you would, just keep your hand up a little bit. He's going to give you a new outline. We're going to get to that in a minute. We're still on the old outline, okay? And I don't like it when I do it that way, but I, I, I can't time this perfectly because the clock just ticks, okay? And we've got things to teach. So um, we're going to be on the old outline of fornication, but we're going to be starting the new one on homosexuality tonight. I'm glad you were here. Hope you had a good week so far. And um, just really appreciate everybody coming out to study God's Word together. Anybody else need an outline for tonight? New outline. Stephen, looks like uh, Sadie. Anybody else? After Sadie, anybody else? Okay, great. So we will get to that in a minute. But remember, we're not going to be on that outline to start with. We're going to be on the fornication outline. We're going to finish that one up here in just a few moments. So, All right. Stephen's got them coming in there. Sadie, all right. Everybody set then? All right, let's go ahead and bow. We'll go to God in prayer, and then we'll jump into our study. Thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy for the night and the occasion that we have to study your word. Help us, Father, to use your guide, your book, your Bible that you've given us as the guidebook for our morality, for our lives, for our godliness, uh, as to how to please you and how to know you and how to do the things that would bring honor and glory to you. Please bless our study together, Father. May we be um, wise as serpents and harmless as doves and scriptural and stand four square on your word. Help us to teach the gospel to those who need it, to a lost and dying world. Help us to be light and salt. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, last time we were dealing with our lesson on fornication. That's your old outline. And um, we talked about, um, well, we just, I'm just going to run down quickly what we talked about. We talked about the definition of fornication, and we kind of uh, expanded that out and really what fornication is all about. We talked about the devastation of fornication. Remember, it devastates us physically, emotionally, and ultimately spiritually. And then last time when we ended, we were right at number three. So that is Roman numeral number three, the defeat 
of fornication. How do I beat this if it is in my life or if it is a temptation for me? How do I beat it? Number one way that we beat fornication is consideration. All right, let's have a consideration. So as we think about consideration, let's think about, first of all, we need to consider the expectation. What does God expect of us? Sometimes I believe that morality is an, uh, um, sinful morality is an issue in our world because God has simply not been honored. He's not been taught. Okay, He's not been promoted. God has been pulled from society. When you leave God out of the equation, you lose all hope of morality. You lose all hope of goodness. And you can see that. You saw that yesterday in Texas, didn't you? Now, how sad is that? That's tragic. That is heartbreaking. But let me tell you, folks, I don't mean this condescendingly or sarcastically, but that is exactly the fruit of what we have been teaching children for years in our public schools. That is the fruit of it. That's the fruit of atheism. And that's exactly what we did. Remember? No God, no rules. That's the way it works. And by the way, what we're going to deal with tonight, the homosexual agenda, you're going to see a very close um, representation between those two. And you say, really? Really? Yeah, really. Because what's happening is everybody wants to do what feels good to them. Everybody wants to do what they want to do with no consequences to anybody else. And let me tell you, that's exactly where sin leads us. Okay, And so when we're talking about this idea of consider the expectation, what does God expect of our bodies? What does he expect us to do regarding fornication? Let's look at a couple of passages. 1 Thessalonians. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And let's look at verses 4 through 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. If you back up to verse 3, Paul says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, setting apart for a special cause, holiness. The word from which we get our word holy, the word from which we get our word saint. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. You should abstain from fornication. Now notice verse 4. Consider the expectation that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. His vessel is his body. How do we... Handle our bodies. What do we do with our bodies? Well, we have to know how to handle them. Do we use them for good or do we use them for bad? What do we use them for? He said, now the lust of concupiscence or lustful passion, he's talking about the very thing that goes along with fornication. What is it? It's lustful passion, this passionate lustful attitude, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is an avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises, despises not man, but God, who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. So Paul said, consider the expectation. What does God expect of us? First of all, God expects each of us as children of His to abstain from fornication, to know how to possess our bodies. And listen, that's an overall riding principle in this world. We have to know what God expects of us. Not necessarily what feels right, because all the time what God expects of us doesn't always feel right. Now that may sound like a, a strange thing, but it's true. Your body... Uh, physically tells you certain things may feel okay, may be okay, but it is not okay. And again, you remember we, when we started this series of, of morality, we talked about the guidebook. The la this is our guidebook. God tells us how to possess our bodies. And the bottom line is this, folks. There is no excuse. There is no excuse for fornication. We can say, oh, you know what? Well, I, I just, I really have a difficult time with that. There is no question about it. There's no question about it that sexual sins are prevalent in our world. And for some, we'll talk about this when we come to homosexuality, believe it or not, for some, it is more of a temptation than for others. Okay? But that doesn't give us any right to give in to those temptations. Remember that. So, you know, what may tempt you, I'll guarantee you there are folks that are more predisposed to go out and get drunk than others. Now, notice I didn't say that's a gene or, oh, you, you can't fight it. I said there are certain ones that are more predisposed for that. 
personalities make this up. A lot of personalities, and we'll talk about that when we get into homosexuality. But that doesn't give us a right to just let it go. Well, I'm just going to let it go. There are more personalities that, uh, there are types of personalities that are more prone to anger and violence. But as a Christian, I need to know how to possess my vessel. And here, in particular, in the realm of fornication. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6.13. Just a couple of passages. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13. What is the consideration? Consider the expectation. What does God expect of us? Meats for the belly. Belly for the meats, Paul says. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. What's the expectation? To keep ourselves from impurity. To fight these passions, these lustful passions. And, and we're going to talk about some practical things here in, in a moment too. Let's look at Romans 12. One last passage on the idea of considering the expectation. And again, um, these may be things you know, but what these are helps for is for us to understand how we can combat this sinful world. How can we combat that mentality? How can you combat it when somebody says, well, yeah, I'm living in fornication, but you don't understand. It's just difficult for me. Well, we understand that. We're not talking about easy and, and difficult. That's not the issue. The issue is, what is the expectation of my body? Let's um, look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the expectation? God expects us to possess our vessels, our body, in a holy manner. We're not to do what the world does. Now, that's important for you young people to listen to. It's important for all of us to listen to. But young people, listen, today they're going to tell you, the world's going to tell you by example and even by explicit command that there is no big deal with having fornication. There's no big deal in committing this fornication. Uh, you know, that was an antiquated thing that people said it was wrong, but now it's not wrong. Let me tell you, the standard hasn't changed. Your body is still to be used for the glory of God. And when you're young, there's no doubt, there's no doubt that those passions are high. In fact, Paul said, Timothy, you watch your youthful passions. <laughs> be careful of that. Because Paul understood when a person is 18, 19, 16, 15, 14, 20, they are going through things in their body. There are definitely passions there. But passion does not excuse us. Mike, did you have something to say? Yes. Great point. And sacrifice costs us something, doesn't it, Mike? It costs us something. That's what we need to understand. You know, somebody may say, well, well, I can't marry because of this. Maybe a person can't get married because of this. Okay? X. I'm not, I can't get married because of X. Uh, whatever. What is it? Well, health insurance reasons. Um, sometimes senior citizens fall into this, believe it or not. If we get married, then, you know, they'll cut in on our Social Security. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to live together. Okay? And, well... You can't expect them to, to not have their Social Security, can you? No. No, you're more than welcome to, to live in separate places and both have your Social Security. That doesn't mean you give in to the passionful, lustful passions to have sexual relations with one another. And this is included in young and old. Just because you can't marry, just because you shouldn't marry, or you're unable to marry, doesn't give you a right to just go use your body however you want to use it. Okay? And so we need to consider the expectation. Number two. Yeah, Sammy, go ahead. Great point. And that's sometimes what we forget. God's way is the best way. James, did you have something you wanted to say?
Great point. Great point, fellas. All three. Good, good, good comments. Good stuff. We need to understand, and please understand this. Maybe I want to make this a little more clear. Maybe I should make this a little more clear. When we're talking about morality, I want to make, and I'll make this clear when it comes to homosexuality. I hope I'll make this clear. I don't want you to think that what, I'm, what we're teaching here from God's Word is just makes it easy for everybody. Okay, let me tell you, when you and, and young people, I want you to understand this. I remember what it was like to be 15, 16, 17, 18. I'm telling you, when you're going through those changes in your body, there is no question, you know, I, I already know, young men, I already know what's on your mind just about 24-7. I was a young man one time, okay? And, and it, when, so young ladies are on your mind. Young ladies, the same is often true with you. Young men are on your mind. That is good and right in its own right and as long as it doesn't go beyond God's plan. You should like, I, t I tell, you know, boys should like girls. That's the plan, okay? Girls should like boys. That's a wonderful thing. But that doesn't mean that we can engage in every activity we want to, even the activities that our body says, Phew, I would like to do this. Because I understand when you're a teenager and when you're going through those youthful passions that things of the body, boy, this would really be nice, okay? This would feel good, absolutely. But that doesn't give us a license. So I want to be real here. I want to understand your temptations. I don't want you to think Rodney's teaching this stuff and this is just the law and, you know, there's no except. Well, there is no exceptions, but that doesn't mean we don't understand what you're going through. And, and this is a great, great ordeal. That's why the Bible talks so much about it. Because God has made us, if I might say it, sexual creatures. He has made us that way. Hebrews 13, the bed is undefiled. It's a beautiful thing in marriage. But that's where it is in marriage. And it's not so you're missing out. It's, it's, God is not telling you this because he wants you to miss out on the fun. He wants... I'm telling you, this is best for you because God's telling you it's best for you. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Now, the problem is when you're young, it's hard to see that. It is. I, I sat where you sat. How's this going to affect me, seriously? <laughs> I mean, you know, you said that, Ronnie, but is this really going to affect me? All you can do is trust God on what he said because I guarantee you he's the author. He's the creator of you. He knows exactly what is best for you and what is not best for you. Okay, he's not going to keep you from something that's good for you. Remember that. Consider the expectation. God expects me to be pure. Number two, consider the evil. I want you to look at Genesis 39. The, how could you not talk about Genesis 39 a little bit when you come to a situation of fornication? This to me, and we're going to come back to him, by the way, because there's some great, um, there's some great rules here to, to really look at when it comes to Joseph. But Joseph understood something that we would do well to understand today, all right? Sometimes we think, and, and young people, I'm not, I'm not so far removed from you that I don't remember this, okay? So bear with me when I say this. You're out away from mom and dad. Mom and dad may never know about it, okay? They may never know about it. Don't be surprised if they do, though, <laughs> because sometimes what you think mom and dad don't know, they actually do know, but th let's say they don't know about it. There's someone greater that is watching you when you're on a date. Remember that. There's someone greater than your mom and dad watching you. All right? If you just try to please your mom and dad, eventually you're going to step out of that because you're going to be upset with your parents, or you're going to say, I don't agree with that. So don't just try to please your parents. Let's look at who we please. Genesis 39 and verse 9. Joseph would all day after day, come lie with me. Come lie with me, she says. Joseph said, I can't do this. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept anything back from me but thee, because thou, art thou, because thou art his wife. How then, notice carefully, can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? This is what we're doing when we commit fornication. We're sinning against God. He wants the best for you. He loves you. Now, I'm sure there are Christians from time to time caught up in fornication. Now think about that. How could you be caught up in fornication, in a regular fornication lifestyle, and then come and commune with the saints and with God? How could you remember his precious blood that washes your sins away? Drink that fruit of the vine. How could you do that as a Christian, knowing that you're living a fornicating lifestyle? They're not in harmony because you're doing a great sin against God. And we love God. You don't want to do that against God. You don't want that. And let me tell you, if you're a faithful Christian, 
I mean, if you know what you're doing and you really know how to live the Christian life, that's going to be a guilt trip for you. It really is. You're going to be guilty. I know. I was there as a teenager. I, I know some of the crazy, stupid things I did. And, and I look at that and I say, how in the world could I ever come and commune with the saints? How could I sit in Bible class and study God's word when I was living such a, such a second life? It's guilty. I felt guilty for that. But you know what? Christianity's not meant to be lived guilty. It, we, we shouldn't live guilty. We shouldn't come in here guilty. We should be freed from the bondage of sin and the practice of sin. And that's the beauty of having our sins forgiven. So don't continue in it. Stop it. Get, get, get out of it. I'm going to give you a couple of practical ways here in a minute. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. We read this a minute ago. I just want you to notice the evil. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification that you abstain, stay away from, fornication. Now you say, you know, do Christians ever have a problem with this? Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica. Yes, Christians can have a problem with this. But that's why we need to teach and preach on it. That's why we need to encourage one another. That's why we need to give young people alternatives to this. So you don't get caught up into it. And, and let me just say this, too. It's one of the reasons it's so important for a Christian to date a Christian. Now, I know I get a lot of opposition on that because people say, well, you know, you can't always date a Christian. You can't. I understand that. I understand all that. And if you're not going to date a Christian, at least try to date somebody that's morally right because when you get two people that are pulling in the same direction, it will change the outcome of fornication. If you have one person pulling, especially if you're a young lady, if your fellow that you're dating does not believe what I'm teaching tonight, it's going to be very difficult, very difficult for him as he gets emotionally attached to you to not want to involve himself in fornication. All right? That's why it's so important to be careful who you date. One last thing on the dating scene, and I will not try to ride my hobby horse tonight. That's why it's very important for children not to date too young. Because when you date, what's too young, Rodney? I'm not going to go there, don't worry, all right? But when you date too young, you get too emotionally attached, and that's when things start happening. And I tell you, my parents set an age for me to date. Okay? Let me tell you, I'm not going to tell you the age. But I'll tell you one thing, it was way too young. I was not able to handle it at that age, Okay? You may be. So that's why I'm not going to give you the age, but I'm simply saying this. Parents, be careful at what age your children begin to date. All right? That's all I'm going to say. That's a parent thing. <laughs> I'm not going to parent your children. But it has been proven children that date at a young age often get themselves involved in fornication quickly. All right. Thirdly, consider the expense. Now, we're not going to spend any time on this because we already went through this. What's the expense? <laughs> How about physically? Remember all those STDs we listed? Physically. How about emotionally? What it does to you emotionally? It does things to you. It does things to your psyche. And then thirdly, spiritually. Well, we've already looked at that, okay? So I want you just to consider the expectation. What does God expect of you? Consider the evil. This is sin against God. Sin against yourself. And then thirdly, consider the expense. Now, how do I abstain from fornication? How do I quit it if I'm involved in it? Number one, consideration. Number two, carefulness. All right? So this is probably maybe more geared to the young people that are going to be dating, but I, I, this is really applicable to everybody. Be extremely careful as to what situations you allow yourself to be placed in. Okay? Let me give you practicality here. Okay? Let me give you practical advice. When I was young, spotting deer in Pennsylvania was a big thing. I don't know that it's that big anymore, or at least I'm not involved in it as much. But when I was a kid, that was huge. We all spotted deer. Everybody loved to spot deer. Does everybody know what spotlighting deer is? All right. You have a spotlight hanging out the window, you look for deer. Okay. Well, that was really a popular thing when I got my driver's license to take a girl spotting deer. A lot of the girls I dated were country girls, and they liked the country, and, you know, had me old four-wheel drive pickup truck, and I could go back in the fields, and I could put her in four-wheel drive, and it was cool, and I was the coolest cat in the world, and I had my spotlight hanging out the window. I soon learned that a spotlight in the dark in a backfield looking for deer is not a good idea for a young man who has his mind on more than deer, Okay. It's just not a good idea. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that to say this. Be careful of the situations you put 
yourself in. Make sure those situations aren't those intimate situations. What are intimate? Well, if you go to a really nice restaurant and, and you want to sit down, what do, they, what do they normally do at a really nice restaurant? They, they dim the lights, don't they? Why do they do that? Why do they do that? That's because it's romantic. It's romantic. So think about this. Now, let's use a little common sense. Let's make sure we be careful in our dimly lit areas. If your parents are away, be very careful of being at home alone with your date. Just, Christian, make it a point. I'm not going to put myself in that situation. And we're going to look at this in a minute. Well, let's just go right now. Let's go to Genesis 39. Let's just, let's just let Joseph tell us about it. I want you to see, back to Genesis 39, because this is really interesting. And the Bible's the best, the best handbook we can have on this, okay? The Bible's the great book. So look at it. Genesis 39, 10 and 11. When was Joseph tempted? Yes, Joshua. I'm sorry. Letter B is carefulness. Carefulness. So we have consideration. Consider the expectation, the evil, and the expense. And then we have the um, carefulness. So Genesis 39, 10, and 11, I want you to notice this. And it came to pass, as she, Potiphar's wife, spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her to be with her. Now I want you to notice verse 11. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went in the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house therewith. And what did she do? Verse 12, she caught him by the arm. When did she do that? Well, there was a whole crowd of people around. No, there wasn't a crowd of people around. They were the only two in the house. She grabbed him by the arm and she says, now it's time for you. Come on, let's go together. What does that tell me? That should tell us that when I'm alone, well, you say, Rodney, that is kind of what a date is about, isn't it? I mean, we don't want to take the preacher on the date. I don't know why you wouldn't. But if you don't want to, then okay. But be careful the areas that you go into. Be careful of parked cars. Be careful of dimly lit places. Be careful of movie theaters. Are you telling me I can't go on a date in a movie theater? I'm not telling you anything, all right? I am telling you from advice and from a perspective that we need to be careful of certain places when we're on a date. Because if we want to do the right thing, we have to set ourselves up for success, right? We don't want to set ourselves up for failure. So be careful of the places that we go. Th this just can't be overemphasized. Be careful. So be careful what? The places you go, be careful the people you date, okay? Young men, you can tell a lot by the way a girl dresses, all right? If she has very little clothing on, she's probably not afraid to take that little bit of clothing off. So be careful of that. Don't date those kind of girls. Be careful who you date. I, I'm going to stop right there or I'll overstep my bounds, I'm sure. Fornication is not something to be taken lightly, folks. Its effects and its consequences are real. But I'm going to end this on a positive note. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 6. I love this one, and you're going to love it too. Because let's say you here are involved in fornication, or you know somebody that's involved in fornication. Man, just kind of hit me right between the eyes of the ball bat. No, what we did was we tried to encourage you to do the right thing. But I want you to notice 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. So a fornicator will not receive the kingdom of God. He will not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Oh, we're going to come back to this one. Nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind. Nor thieves, nor covenant, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Boy, don't stop at verse 10, okay, Rodney? Here's the beauty of it, Christian. Are you ready for verse 11? And such were some of you. Corinth had a problem with it. They were involved in fornication. But you know what Paul said? No, no, you've left it. You are washed, you are sanctified, and you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. If you have engaged in fornication as a Christian, you can be forgiven of it. Now, as I stated last week, are there still possible physical and emotional strain that you're going to suffer? Absolutely. That's why I hope I got to you before you committed the sins. But if I didn't, be aware that God can forgive this. In closing, I want to say one last thing. I had a teenage girl that was in my teenage class one time, congregation we were working with. She came into my office one day, her and her parents, one Sunday morning. 
They said, I've got to talk to you, Rodney. I said, sure, what's up? Um, they said her name. She's, she's pregnant. She's 14 years old. She's pregnant. I said, oh, man. All right. All right. We don't know where to turn. She's a Christian. I said, let me share with you where we're going to turn. This is where we're going to turn. We turn right to this passage. I said, what you've done is commit fornication. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I said, now the problem is you're pregnant. And so the fellow that you're with is probably going to say, well, what can it hurt now? We may as well continue. I said, you've got to stop it. You've got to say no. You've got to distance yourself from that situation. Number one, you have the child. That was never a question. These people were good moral people. Number two, you stop the fornication immediately. And number three, you make it right with God. And maybe I should have put that one first, but we went in that order. And she said, can I be forgiven? And I said, you can be washed completely clean. You can be forgiven of this. And so she made the decision. She wanted to walk up front at the end of that sermon. And she sat down with tears in her eyes. And I sat beside her. And I said to the congregation, now there are some things. And I said her name. She's been involved with. And I said, in a little bit, they'll be pretty evident as to what she's been involved with. But I said, she would like to be forgiven. She'd like to stop this in her life. And she wants forgiveness and support. You know what the church did? That's what I love about my brethren. They all rushed to her and hugged her and, and loved on her. And man, those ladies and that car, her mother was a really great mom too. But those ladies of the congregation helped her. Listen, while you're going through your pregnancy, let me know what I can help you with. I, I've been there. I know how this feels. I know what you're going through. She had such a support system. She had that little baby. And, you know, now I got to talk to the fella too. I got to talk to the fella. And I wasn't quite as easy on him. He wasn't a Christian, but I told him. This is the way it's going to have to be, fella, okay? This is the way it's going to have to be. Number one, you're going to support that baby. And number two, I, I can be mean when I have to be. You're going to support that baby. And number two, you're not going to touch her again, okay? Because it's sinful and she's a Christian and you're going to stay away from her. And uh, he kind of he sat back and looked at me, but, but that was the way it was. And you know what? I believe with all my heart, I, I don't know where she's at now, but if she remains faithful, she'll be in heaven. That little baby, if he's... Well, baby's older now. <laughs> that little baby be in heaven. Hopefully that, that child will be in heaven. That little boy will be in heaven. And, and you know what? She was washed of that. God forgave her. God put it behind him as far as the east is from the west. And so if you've done this, God can forgive you, okay? Make the right choice. The right choice is not to give up. The right choice is not to end your life. The right choice is to come penitently to God and say, God, please forgive me. I've gotten wrapped up in this and I'm sorry. And God will forgive your sins and wash your slate clean, and you can be as pure as you were before you started fornication in his eyes. All right? Whew. These are tough subjects, aren't they? Man, I'll tell you what. I'm looking forward to the next one. This isn't going to get any easier. You got your new outline? You ready? That was fornication. That kind of opened the door to the next one we're going to talk about. The next one we're going to talk about is homosexuality. Consider the moral issues we face. Homosexuality. That's got to be at the top of the list. Yeah, James. Good, James. <laughs> Amen. Yep. Yep, I agree.
That's a really good point, James. Uh, for those who couldn't hear James, he said, as we grow and as we change as a Christian, there are different thoughts, but we still have to take them captive. That's a good point. Boy, don't you wish you just had like one thought you could take captive and then that was it for the rest of your life? All right, you did it good. You did a good job. Now you're good, right? But they do change. Young people, let me say one thing before we get into the homosexuality. If you're struggling with fornication, if you're struggling with those thoughts, if you're struggling with that, that lustful passion, I will say this. It won't last forever. It seems like it will. It won't last forever. I will say this. Sometimes when you get older, um, it, it, it takes a lot, a lot of years before it gets any better. But um, that it will get better eventually. It will get better. And um, for the fellows that are in here, even middle-aged to older fellows, they know that often this doesn't ever leave a man. Um, I've known some 80 and 90-year-old men that, that still struggled with this, with, with looking and with thoughts. And so, you know, we keep fighting. We keep fighting, we keep taking those thoughts captive, and we keep doing the right thing. And you know what? The darts get a little easier as you go through one battle after another battle. We can, we can, we can ward them off a little better, all right? So I want to give you hope. There's hope here. You can do this, all right? Every person sitting here, whether we've messed up with it or whether we haven't messed up with it, we know this, that we're here tonight, better people because we fought that battle. Keep fighting the battle. Don't give in, all right? Let's look at homosexuality. Homosexuality as an acceptable, even flagrantly proud way of life has become much more prevalent in our society. I, I, I don't have to tell you that. You know that. You know that. Those who support the practice often do so under the banner of equality, which I think is really interesting because as I drove today, I had to run an errand, and as I drove today, I saw a rainbow flag, and it said um, something to the effect of equality. Equality. And I thought, this is great because I already had this in my lesson tonight, and Boy, there's an example of it, okay? So those that are pushing this agenda are doing so under the banner of equality and the right to choose your own sexuality. Now, that's what the world's saying, okay? I have a right to choose my own sexuality. I have the right to be equal, okay? So if I want to marry a man, if I'm a man and I want to marry a man, I should have everything equal to a man that marries a woman. That's, that's what they're pushing right now in, in our world. There are many openly gay churches, Okay, that's not um, hard to figure out. There are some in our community that have a big old rainbow flag out and they're not supporting the ark and God's promise. They are openly embracing. Now, we're going to talk all about this, so don't, please don't get, I hope you don't get angry with me or anything and say, well, well, well shouldn't we love them? We're, we're going to talk about this. We're going to get down through all this, how we should react uh, biblically, biblically. But, but they're openly saying, come, come as you are. Be a part of this. Um, there are openly gay preachers in mainstream denominations. Uh, what was unheard of, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, is now becoming very accepted in our world. In fact, uh, to not have uh, some gay preachers in the mainstream denominations is, is crazy. I mean, if you're a gay preacher, you, you come out, you be proud of that, is what they say. That's what the world says. Homosexuality is ever before us because we see it on every front, and there are destination, vacation destination places that you and I would want to go to that are openly supportive of this, very openly supportive, okay? I mean, they'll have special days, special weeks, special times that you can partake in these. Um, I know some big resorts that do this. Um, so it's before us. Because it's before us, we need to examine it biblically. Now, what some congregations of God's people are doing is they're doing this. And they're hiding, and they are not being very vocal about it because they're scared to death about it, all right? Preachers are afraid to do it because they're afraid of what the congregation may say. Uh, they're afraid of what their live stream media people might say. They're afraid of what the world will say, all right? I'm afraid of what God will say if I don't teach this subject, okay? So I have to teach it. Woe is unto me if I don't teach this subject, okay? I have to teach it. Um, we need to teach it and examine it biblically for a couple of reasons. Number one, some are questioning whether it really is sinful or not. Now, I know for those of us who are, are trying to live moral lives, we're scratching our head and you say, are you kidding me? But that's where we're at, folks. That's where we're at. They're questioning whether it's sinful or not. The second reason we need to examine it biblically, and please understand this, is because sometimes as Christians, our reaction to it is very sinful on both fronts. Sometimes we're super silent about it, which is sinful. And sometimes we're very mean about it, which is also sinful. 
Okay? So I want us to understand that's one of the reasons we need to deal with this. We need to deal with the subject because you and I need to know how to face it because we're facing it. And we want to face it properly. We want to face it right. We want to face it like God would want us to face it. So in the real um, morality spectrum, there is a lot of discussion about homosexuality. It is all over our world today. So let's delve into it. Let's see what the Bible has to say. But before we do that, we really need to do a little bit of clarification. Okay? I think this will be good for you. Some of you will be like, yep, Rodney, I know that. Excellent. Just sit here and listen if you could. And if you don't know it, then pay a little ex, uh, more uh, attention to it. Number one, here's on your outline. This will be your first blank. The expression. The expression. So when we speak of homosexuality today... The topic is a bit more encompassing and complex than just is said about homosexuality. Okay? Let me share with you why it's more complex. This was a 2021 acronym. I am very well aware that in 2022 there are many letters added to this acronym. Okay? I'm going to give you the main gist of kind of the June of 2021 acronym, the expression of homosexuality. But there are many, many more letters, but we would be here 16 weeks if I dealt with every letter, okay? And probably still miss a couple. So I want to deal with the main ones. What are they? They're L-G-B-T-Q-2, okay? L-G-B-T-Q-2. Now, if you look that up and you research that, you can go to their website. Okay, and you can actually find they'll add another Q in there. It's QQ, and then there's a two, and then there's an A, and and so I'm saying I know there's a lot more letters. So I don't want you to say that's not right, Ronnie. There's a bunch more to it. These are the main ones that I want to deal with in this class. Okay, let's talk about those. L. What is L? Lesbian. Lesbian is a female homosexual. Simply put, lesbian's a female homosexual. Gay usually refers to a male homosexual. Now, why am I going through these letters? Because every one of our young people are confronted with that acronym. They're confronted with it at school, right? Allie, my way off on this? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's before us. Gay also includes a lesbian. A lesbian is a gay, but when they talk about gay, they're usually usually referring to, and the reason I, huh, I don't want to be condescending, but it's so confusing, depending on who you talk to. So I'm, I've got this off their website, by the way. This is, this is current information from the LBGTQ2, a lot of other letters. Bisexual is the B, LGB. Bisexual is one who's sexually attracted to both males and females. Okay, that's bisexual. The T is transgender. This is an umbrella term and I quote, I'm quoting this, umbrella term referring to those whose gender identity differs from their gender at birth. Okay? So I was born a boy, but I don't want to be a boy, so I'm going to be transgender. I'm going to be like a girl. I'm going to, I'm going to dress like a girl. I'm going to be a girl as far as that can go. Okay? That's what a transgender is. Again, you probably know some of this. Um, I got some education on this today. So I was excited about that. The Q, what is Q? I was totally amazed at this. I got it off their website. Um, Q can stand for two things. And that's why they put the double Q in the 2022. Queer is one of them. Which I was shocked. Because at one time that was a very derogatory term toward a homosexual. That is no longer a derogatory, I guess it would be in the context in which you'd give it. But they are saying queer. The other Q is questioning. Queer or questioning. Let's talk about those. Queer is an umbrella term. Please understand, I got this off their website. It's not derogatory. I'm not being derogatory toward them. I thought at first I was, but as I read, I'm not. Um, it's an umbrella term for those who are not heterosexual. So basically, if you're not a heterosexual, you're, you're known as a, as a queer. Um, questioning those who are questioning and often experimenting um, with their gender and they're exploring other options. Okay, that is what the questioning is. They haven't figured it out. The two is kind of interesting. This is a person who believes inside them they have two spirits. They have a male spirit and a female spirit in one body. And so from what I understand, 
they, they sometimes will be, so this is kind of like real closely associated with transgenderism, but not fully. So sometimes they will behave like a male. Sometimes they will behave like a female. It just depends on which of the spirits is um, stronger at that point in time. may not be that day, maybe that week, that month, that year. They kind of jump back and forth. There are some indigenous people on Turtle Island that um, are really big on this two-spirited thing. They're, they're kind of a mystical um, situation. So that's interesting. It's a male and a female spirit in one body. Okay, LGBTQ, you know what I said. That, that's what we're going to go with, okay? So that's the explanation. That's what we're going to talk about, okay? We're going to break that down, and we're going to look at that. All right, so that just gives us a little background. That's the expression. That's how people are expressing themselves today. So let's look at the edicts. Number two on your sheet, the edicts. What edicts? E-D-I-C-T-S. The commands of God. What does God say about this? What does God say about this? E-D-I-C-T-S. Why couldn't you just use commands, Rodney? Doesn't begin with an E, okay? <laughs> Don't give me that, Brielle. It doesn't begin with an E, okay? <laughs> edicts. All right. I want to look at three different dispensations. When we talk about dispensations... Um, if you've been to any of the fast, or not fast food, if you've been to any of the um, uh, coffee shops around, you go in, and sometimes they have a machine there that dispenses your cream and sugar. Know what I'm talking about? You put it under there, and you press one if you want one sugar, you press two if you want. That's dispensing of that particular item. Dispensation, when we talk biblically, we're talking about how God dispensed, gave his law. There are three of those that we read about in the scripture. There is the patriarchal dispensation. So let's talk about under patriarchy. You say, we don't live under patriarchy today. No, but what I want to show, and what I think is really important that we show, is God's continued attitude and wrath and hatred against sin in general, and in particular, this sin. Okay? So let's look at Genesis 1. 26 and 27. Remember, our class is not only trying to teach us things to where we become more knowledgeable, it's also getting to equip us. Because, folks, we have to deal with this stuff properly. If we don't, we'll be in trouble. Okay, we're going to deal with it wrongly if we don't. Either by being completely silent or by being mean-spirited. And we don't want to be either one. Because that wouldn't bring glory to God. We want to bring glory to God in our, um, in our answer with these questions. So, let's look at the patriarchal dispensation. Let's go back to the very beginning of creation. And let's look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27. I think it's very important. And again, remember you know, the, the, um, the acronym we just used. Remember that. Keep that in mind as we go through these edicts. God said, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Where we begin is very important. God created male and female. Okay, now we're going to expand this a bit, but right now I want us to notice he didn't make somebody in between. And by that, I'm not being mean-spirited when I say that. I'm being factual. I'm going to have to be factual while we go through this. Please understand, I'm going to deal a little bit with well, 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 then what's going on with a boy that thinks he's a girl? What's going on with a girl that thinks she's a boy and wants to be a boy? What, what's up with that? We'll talk about that. But right now I want us to look at the edicts of God. God created male and female. Didn't create two spirits in one. Didn't create somebody that could switch back and forth. He created a male and he created a female. Let's go to Genesis 2 and verse 23. Upon the creation of Eve, Adam said this. This is now bone of my bone. You know the story. Adam lay down. I'm going to take a piece out of your rib. I'm going to take a rib out of your flesh. I'm going to create you something. Great. Why? Because hippos and stuff like that weren't good. Now that's important too, isn't it? Because what we're dealing with today is some people that are, that are identifying with animals. 
and they believe sexually they are with animals. Well, that doesn't work. Adam said, I, this, all these animals I gave names to, but they don't fit my, they don't fit me. <laughs> They're not my help me. God said, I'm going to make you somebody that's just like you, but a little bit different. All right. He said, verse um, uh, 20. Three, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, from the very beginning of creation, see how important the book of Genesis is? <laughs> it tells us what God's plan for humanity was and is. It is male and female. And I know you've heard the old, the old, I remember this old black preacher came to our area. Man, he was preaching, you know, in the book of Genesis. And he said this, you just remember this, folks. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, you know, and amen. The whole congregation roared with amen. But it is so true. God made male and female. Adam knew he was a man. Eve knew she was a woman. And they fit together perfectly. Did you notice that? The two were one flesh. They fit exactly how God wanted. If you read the rest of the story, they bore children. Exactly was God's plan. And they could only do that as male and female, by the way. That, that's the only way they can bear children. By God's standard, that's the only way they can do it. All right? So let's, and, and, and by the way, even by man's standard today, you can't have a child unless you have the seed of woman and the seed of man. There's a reason. God created us that way. That's why it doesn't change. All right? Let's look at Matthew 19. You say, well, you're in the patriarchal dispensation. Why are you going to Matthew 19? Because I want you to see something that's really important. I was surprised when I began to do my research on this subject. There are some religious folks that say, do you know what Jesus said about homosexuality? Ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. And then there's a great big blank space. He said nothing about homosexuality. And so therefore, for you to teach and preach against it is wrong. Jesus never said anything about it. Let me tell you, Jesus did say something about it. He said it right here in Matthew 19. Look at it. Verses 4 and 5. Jesus was questioned about marriage. He was questioned about marriage. And here's what he said. He answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Let me ask you something. It's time to quit. Let me ask you something. Did Jesus believe what Moses wrote about Adam and Eve? Did Jesus uphold that standard? Did Jesus advocate for that standard? That's what he's doing in Matthew 19. Did Jesus, by implication, speak against homosexuality? Absolutely did. He was not for it. He never was for it, and he wouldn't be for it in his word, okay? I've gone a couple of minutes over. I got to, to, to teach in there, and I didn't see where we were at. Let's stop right there. He gave us a good wedding of our appetite. Let's come back next week. What we're going to deal with is the rest of the patriarchal dispensation. We're going to talk about the Mosaic dispensation, the book of Leviticus, that... Allie had a great comment a couple of weeks ago. Allie, you said they said they can't lie with boy. Boy, I'm going to have something there for you, okay? So hang tight on that, and then we're going to talk about the Christian dispensation. We'll continue down through this. Thank you so much for your patience, you coming to class, and um, just thank you for supporting the truth so much. I love you folks.